Hello, and welcome to everyone here in San Francisco and in our virtual audience. My name is Lolly Schiffman. I am a proud alumna of the University of Minnesota with degrees from the College of Biological Sciences and the medical school. For me, and for many of you, that solid educational foundation paved our ways, our ways to promising futures. By participating in this event, you are strengthening your connection to the university and all it offers to us, our communities, our country, and the world. Your support and advocacy for the University of Minnesota are hugely important and effective, and thank you for that. The last time we gathered in San Francisco like this was November of 2019. Things changed. <laughs> so I am now delighted to welcome the university back to our beautiful city by the bay. In doing my re research, I came across something that stopped me in my tracks. Just listen to this list of some of humanity's deadliest enemies. Toxic shock syndrome, HIV AIDS, SARS, antibiotic resistance, foodborne diseases, bioterrorism, influenza, diseases transmitted between animals and humans, Ebola as an example, and diseases caused by viruses such as the Zika virus and the dengue virus transmitted by mosquitoes, ticks, and flies. This is a sobering list but it reflects the breadth and depth and long history of the work in public health by Dr. Michael Osterholm. There is another long list that compiles his many accomplishments and accolades. He is Regents Professor, McKnight Presidential Endowed Chair in Public Health and the founder and director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy, as well as a distinguished teaching professor in the Division of Environmental Health Sciences, all at the University of Minnesota. He advises the World Health Organization, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the Biden administration, among many, many more key organizations. His publications and scientific articles and books, including Deadliest Enemy, could and should fill a library. And there's a very new addition to this impressive list. Two weeks ago, this amazing man served as the Grand Marshal at the University of Minnesota's homecoming festivities. <laughs> He did a very good job and was a big hit. <laughs> I know, because I was there. And it seemed to me Dr. Osterholm loves the University of Minnesota, and the University of Minnesota loves him back. It is an honor to be here in this role, and it is a big responsibility. I thought I could use some help. So I asked friends and family members, if you got the chance, what would you want to say to Dr. Osterholm? Dr. Osterholm, this is what we want you to hear from us. For your nearly five decades of research, scholarship, and leadership in the vast arena that is public health, giving us answers long before we even knew we had questions. Thank you. For your exceptional ability to communicate clearly 
and understandably, offering us advice we can safely follow, information we can trust, a virtual shoulder we can lean on as we grieve these unthinkable losses, and a helping hand to hold as we navigate these confusing and frightening times. Thank you. And for telling us the truth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now I ask you all to join me in extending a joyful welcome to the San Francisco Bay Area to Dr. Michael Osterholm. Thank you. Distance does that. <laughs> well, first of all, Allie, thank you for that very, very, very kind introduction. I must admit that um, it's very humbling. And to see all of you out here in the audience tonight, it's just, wow, oh my. <laughs> so thank you. I, it means the world. And, and I have to say that for any of you wondering, Lally has become one of my new best friends over the course of this entire event and planning for it. And uh, it means the world to me, so thank you. As you see, I'm not alone up here, and I happen to be very fortunate to have with me tonight the interim dean of the School of Public Health, someone who was just introduced to you. And Tim Beebe, who really, if you're in the School of Public Health or in the area that he's worked in, needs no introduction. He's a remarkable gift to public health. In addition to his faculty and leadership roles in the school, he also serves as the deputy director of the University Center for Learning Health System Sciences, do I want to get that wrong, and senior advisor to the university's Clinical and Translational Sciences Institute. It really is my pleasure and honor to be up on the stage with Tim tonight and to know that uh, I am so fortunate to be led in the School of Public Health by somebody of such not only great professional qualities, but he's really a wonderful, wonderful person. So Tim, thank you. Thank you, thank you. If you keep saying such nice things, you will be my new best friend. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Mike. So um, it's an honor to serve as the school's interim dean. Um, the School of Public Health is the only school of public health accredited school of public health in Minnesota. We train two-thirds of the public health workforce in uh, the state. We, our students uh, transform the practice of public health across the world. For 75 years, the school has taken on and grappled with the most vexing public health challenges. In 2020, our media mentions jumped 524% um, because of pand pandemic-related media attention and due to one man. He's on my left, in case you were wondering. So I am so proud to call him a friend and a colleague, uh, and that he's a tenured professor in our School of Public Health. I want to personally thank you for all that you've done uh, throughout the pandemic and through all, throughout your, your career. I met Mike back when I was at the Department of Human Services and he was the state epidemiologist and I just was wowed back then. Um, he was actually training to swim the English Channel at the time. <laughs> Another story. Um, so I am so happy to be up here and, and, and it's a privilege to, to be asking some of the questions that uh, you all submitted. Uh, we've tried to aggregate those questions and, and kind of thematically and so I think we will pivot now to the questions. Does that sound good? Sounds good, thank you. All right, so can you just say a little bit more about your, um, I don't know if we have a, I think we have a photo of you as uh, Grand Marshal. And if you wanna say. <laughs> oh my. What, how was that experience? They, looks like you have company. Well, well first of all, this photograph actually represents a lot of my life. But let me start out by a story. So I get this phone call from someone whose name is very familiar to me, but I don't think it's her. 
the president of the Alumni Association, telling me I had been chosen to be the Grand Marshal for the homecoming parade. I assumed I was getting punked. <laughs> and as such, I kind of went on with it, and okay, 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 and I was ready to hang up, and then I realized this was real. <laughs> and then my next th thought was, what's wrong with the university? <laughs> <laughs> Me? So, you know, I think it's this photograph, which I had not seen before. What you see there is my partner, Fern Peterson, and some of my grandkids. This really represented to me kind of a, a, a completing the circle of life, you might say. I have been at the U for 47 years. While I've served in other roles, I've always been at the university. I've been an advisor since 1978. And it's hard to express how you love something, how you care about something. And for a couple of you in the room who are old enough, you may remember the song to Sir With, or to the movie To Sir With Love, Sidney Poitier. And in that, he was a engineer who couldn't find a job, but he ended up getting a school teacher's job in the roughest areas of London. And over the course of the year, he took a group of really very difficult high school students to a very special place. And in the end of the song, and there's a song that goes with it by Lulu, it's to serve with love, and the line is, how do you thank someone who's taken you from perfume, crayons to perfume? Well, if you could gender adjust that, the University of Minnesota has done that for me. I cannot imagine being in any other place in the whole world doing what we do. The people at SIDRAP today, the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy, a number of us have been there together now for 35 years. And, you know, we can dance in the dark and not bump into each other. And I think that that's in part due to the team, but it's also due to the University of Minnesota. So this picture represents my love for the U, but my grandchildren represent why I do what I do. You know, I, I'm, I'm almost 70 years old, and people keep saying, when are you going to retire? And every day I look at those five grandkids, and I think about what kind of world are they growing up in? And I don't know if I can ever retire. Because you know what? It's, every day is another opportunity, another day, to try to make the world a better place. And right now, for a whole lot of reasons in infectious diseases, it's a challenging world. So being able to have my grandkids there um, and to be able to be part of this was a gift beyond anything I could ever thank the U. And, you know, here's a growing man in a parade, kids throwing candy out, everybody yelling at it, and I had tears running down my cheeks. <laughs> it was such a moving moment. So that's the story behind the story behind the story. Thank you. Very nice. <laughs> All right, switching now to the questions from the audience. Um, in terms of the U.S. and COVID, where are we right now? Have we moved from pandemic to endemic? I don't know. I don't know. Um, this virus has thrown more 210 mile an hour curveballs at us than any other infectious agent I've ever known. And I'll include HIV in that. Um, Influenza pandemics, which are the, what we usually think of as a new virus emerging, a respiratory transmitted virus that spreads around the world, raises havoc for two to three years, like the 1918 pandemic, and then it becomes part of the everyday milieu of flu viruses. We are now, and I just did a podcast that was published yesterday, that we're now, I think, in what I call the fourth phase of the pandemic. Nowhere close to being out of it, nowhere close. Even though we're all done with the virus, the virus is not done with us yet, it's not. The first phase occurred right after it emerged from Wuhan, where in that first year of 2020, it caused these major spikes in cases in selected geographic regions, cities, some counties, but not widespread all around the world in a big way. And we had no vaccines and we had no drugs. Well, by the end of the year, we were obviously very enthusiastic about these new vaccines, which, you know, I think public health 
did itself an injustice by, in a sense, concluding that everything was solved now because we didn't know how long these vaccines would really hold, how, how much protection would it last for how long. We knew in the first 60 to 90 days after you got the vaccine, it worked well. But that also was the virus of that first year. And it was at that time that I got myself into a lot of trouble, um, good trouble as far as I'm concerned, because I saw what was happening with this thing called variants, where the virus was mutating quickly in a way that we had not seen any other respiratory pathogen change. And through the course of the first year, the changes were kind of considered like rings on a tree, growth curves. You know, you could say, well, the virus has gone this many generations or done this, but nothing about its functionality, you know, same virus. Well, by the end of 2020, when the alpha variant emerged, particularly in Europe, we saw a virus that could change how infectious it was, it could change how it might cause more serious illness, and it could even in some cases potentially change in such a way that it would evade the immune protection from previous infections or previous vaccinations. And in January of 2020, uh, 21, on Meet the Press, I said, I thought the darkest days of the pandemic were still ahead of us. And man, you could have had my head quartered in so many circles around the world because I'm just a scaremonger. But I saw these variants coming. And then Alpha did arrive. And then Delta arrived. And then the worst of all was Omicron. And that was really phase two to me. It was the kind of mountain peak of cases. And then it dropped precipitously to a mountain valley. And we thought, oh, it's done. And then another mountain peak of cases and a valley. And that was phase two. Phase three occurred when Omicron became the, the variant of choice, and for which at that time, it didn't disappear and was replaced by another variant, you know, pi or sigma. These are all named for Greek letters in the alphabet. But rather, we saw these subvariants develop. All of them were Omicron origin, but they kept changing, they kept changing. And we just have gone through phase three of the last year, where instead of the mountain peaks up and down, we've had as a high plains plateau. It's just been relatively constant and only slightly coming down now. We have lost, on average, 425 to 450 people a day, every day, seven days a week, for the last 12, 14 to 16 weeks makes it the number four cause of death in the country. And people, it's gone, it's over with. Now, grant you, many of the people who are getting very ill and are, un, are, are clearly at risk for that because either they're, they're older, which is a risk factor, I understand it well, they're also not vaccinated. So but everybody assumed this was gonna be the soft landing. But about six to eight weeks ago, we started seeing something brand new. Now the subvariants that we're seeing for this Omicron virus are having, experiencing the highest and most amazing immune evasion you could imagine, where basically these subvariants will do a lot to reduce the protection of any of the previous immunity we've had. And we've got at least four of them that we're looking at right now, that BA27.5.1, you know, XBB, BQ1.1, these are really concerning. And if that's not enough, they're just coming. They're not here yet. They're, 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 I say they're not here yet. They're in a couple percent of the cases out there, but it's, it's building from 0.1% to 5.6% to 8% over just a couple of weeks. But if you've been following what's happening right now, Europe is starting to get crushed. Cases are rising dramatically in at least 15 European countries. And it's not just infections, for which today I don't know what those numbers mean because so few of the cases get reported anymore with home testing, but rather it's hospitalizations and deaths. And this is, something most people aren't aware of, how this is taking off. We're seeing the same thing in Singapore. We're seeing the same thing right now in Bangladesh. 
So why is that happening? It's not the subvariants that I just talked about. They're there, but they're not at that high a level yet. It's largely, I think, because of behavior. We are done with the virus. And so we're all together, large groups, et cetera, and we are not aware of the fact that we are going to start seeing this transmission. Now, will it occur in the United States like it is in Europe? It hasn't yet. And so I think, again, this is where humility becomes job one. I'll say to you tonight, I don't know this is going to happen, but I have every reason to believe it might. And then if you overlay that increase in cases just due to us all getting together again, and then you put the subvariance in with that, and then finally, what we're realizing with this coronavirus, and we shouldn't have been completely surprised by this because we've seen it with other coronavirus infections, it's likely that humans have substantial waning immunity over time. I don't want to hear anybody anymore tell me how well a vaccine works at 30 days or 60 days or 90 days. Tell me how it works at 180 days. Tell me how it works at 360 days. And if you see that big dip in protection, you combine that with a virus now that has already now additional immune evasion and we're just running loose, I think this next six months could be really tough. And then if that's not enough, let's lay it on the reality of where we're at today in our healthcare systems. If any, and there are some of you in the room here who know this firsthand. We have virtually eliminated any excess capacity in healthcare today. Due to the loss of many healthcare professionals who left, who didn't come back, due to the fact that it's not just in hospitals and clinics, but it's in long-term care and step-down, and we have so many people today who are in hospitals who should be in long-term care, who should be in step-down, but there's no place to send them. We have a razor-thin capacity today to take in new cases of anything. And I'll tell you right now, there's a number of intensivists in this country who will tell you, it only is going to take a bump of influenza or COVID to make the conditions in those ICUs worse than it was during Omicron. And we don't really see that. We don't get that. So I think if you put this all together, it's, for lack of a better term, a perfect storm. I hope so badly I'm wrong. I hope. But hope's not a strategy. And so I think where we're at today, Tim, is one, all the indications are not good. Two, there's still a lot you can do about it. I feel confident and comfortable here tonight. I'm fully vaccinated. I have all my doses on board, so at least I got protection for now. And I have my N95, and I feel very comfortable with that protecting me. So I'm not saying people have to stop living their lives. But we are going to have to understand that the disease right now that's killing us as the fourth leading cause of disease in the country could get a hell of a lot worse in the next six to 12 weeks. So if you're gonna live your life in the public domain, which I hope you all do, I hope you get together. My family, what we do is the rule of thumb is you have no contact with anybody in the three previous days we get together who you know has COVID or suspected COVID. Number two, if you have any symptoms, even allergy-like symptoms on the day of, you can't get together. And three, we always make sure that we test. And while that test is not perfect, if you add those three together, I still live my life. And I still spend time with those incredible grandkids. And so I, I hope tonight the message I send to you is stay tuned, but there's still stuff you, things you can do about it. And if you haven't gotten your most recent dose of vaccine, please. As of Friday morning, only 5.8% of U.S. residents eligible to get a booster dose have. That's incredible when you have a virus like this. So I hope that's helpful. When you say booster dose, do you say the second one or the... Oh, I'm the, talking about the, the most recent the one that's the bivalent. You know, if you can get, if you, if you already have uh, additional booster doses on board, that's great. But you can now get the BA5 bivalent vaccine. Thanks, Mike. I think you might have answered like the next five questions. Oh. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I'm a professor. What can right. I say, you know? <laughs> well, less of me talking, so that's good. Um, you know, it, and... Is there a time within the next 30 years where we don't have to worry about COVID-19? And you're, you're being I, I don't, filmed, I don't by know, the way. but let me tell you, 
Um, and this is where, you know, I, I realize that a part of my job, as hopefully I can do it, is one, tell the truth. Number two, you know, I'm born and raised in Iowa, so it's got to make, it's got to be pretty straightforward for me to understand it, okay? So you can't have some A plus B plus C plus miracle stuff, okay? It's got to actually make sense. But we live in a world today where infectious diseases are driving so much of what our society is all about. Give me a case in point. Our economy. I remain kind of puzzled by the fact that everyone is talking about the condition of our economy, but never once talking about the global economy. How would you like to be in Argentina today where infl inflation is at 70%? I can list a whole set of countries out there, and what was the number one reason why? It was the pandemic. It was supply chain disruption, it was worker disruption. And if you look, the war surely has played some role in petroleum-based issues. But right now you got China with 240 million people locked down for COVID and supply chains continue to be seriously interrupted. That is by itself reason to say planning for these pandemics is kind of important. But second of all, the one we're dealing with right now is not the big one. This is not the big one. The one that keeps me awake at night and keeps one eye open is a coronavirus, but taking a slightly different assembly of parts. I had the opportunity in 2003, when I was splitting my time between the University of Minnesota and serving as a special advisor to Tommy Thompson at that time, post 9-11, and the whole issue of bioterrorism. And so I got firsthand F, acknowledge and, and, and effort with the SARS outbreak, a, a coronavirus that spread through China and did spread through the world, but we were able to contain it because people didn't really get that infectious till the fourth or fifth day of their illness. And if we could identify cases or contacts quickly, we could shut it down for ongoing transmission. And we got rid of the animal reservoir we were able to identify in the markets of the Guangdong province. But it was notable that 30% of the people that got SARS died. Well, then along comes MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, a coronavirus that emerged out of camels in the Arabian Peninsula. And I'd been serving as an advisor to the royal family of the EUA. And so I ended up over there in working on that. And the same problem was you had to find cases early and you could shut down human to human transmission. And by the way, you're not gonna put down camels over there. I actually personally saw $40 million camels among the royal camel herd. Um, and, but the thing that was notable, it killed over 30% of people. Now you got SARS-CoV-2 or COVID, and it is highly transmissible, but fortunately it only kills less than 1% of the people. There is nothing, nothing in viral genetics to say that someday this and this, these two are gonna get together. And instead of having a highly infectious virus that kills less than 1%, it could kill 30%. That's the big one. And we are not taking that seriously. We're not seeing it. And so to me, when you ask me about these things, think about this. Right now, with almost 8 billion people on the face of the earth, one out of every eight people who's ever lived is on the face of the earth right now. One out of every eight people. And we need animals to eat. Maybe we sure use those. We have more interaction with animals any time in the human history. And then on top of it, we move around the world overnight. So what was in some distant place yesterday is everywhere tomorrow. So the world has really provided the ideal evolutionary support for these infectious agents. And you know, when I got into the business in 1976, I had more, 75, but I had more people say to me, why are you getting into infectious diseases? This is you know, horse and buggy stuff. <laughs> and at the time, we thought we had defeated infectious diseases. And right now, they're coming back with a vengeance. Whether it's monkeypox, whether it's Ebola, whether it's antibiotic resistance, whether it's COVID. And this is why our School of Public Health and our center, I think, unfortunately have a, a real 
need and the world has a need for them and will continue. And we have to be mindful that, just think about our economy. If you don't think that this was a problem otherwise, think what's happening to you right now. And that goes directly back to the pandemic. Thank you. You just touched upon, you know, how quickly we can get from one side of the globe to the yeah. other. And, and um, one of the questions is, from your perspective, what would be the safest, if any, er areas and modes of travel? So, um, you know, I, I travel extensively. I have traveled extensively. Um, I continue to travel extensively. I think it's all about, first of all, being smart about your travel. I do not pretend to know everything about traveling somewhere. I have a reliable travel, travel clinic that I count on. So even though it's my business, these people follow it every day. They know if drug-resistant malaria suddenly shows up somewhere. So number one, be, surely travel. But when you do, make sure that you have all the things on board, vaccine-wise, advice-wise, as to what to do. Second of all, have a plan if something does happen. For me right now, I don't travel anywhere without my Paxlovid, because while I've not yet had COVID, and by God, I'm gonna try hard not to get it, because I don't, I don't worry about dying as much, but I don't wanna get long COVID. You know, I carry Paxlovid everywhere I go. So should I get sick while I'm in San Francisco? I can take it just like that. Think about things like that. Uh, and then just understanding access to healthcare. How do you get it? Where, where are you going to? Plan ahead, think about if I'm going to this low-income country, middle-income country, will I have access to health care? And I think that that is really, if you do things like that, you, I think you can travel safely. You can travel with managing the risk. And I think so. I would never encourage you to stop traveling. You know, the world is a wonderful place. But uh, just be prepared. You just mentioned long COVID. Um, can you discuss the consequences in, of and the treatments for long COVID? Boy, I wish I could answer this one. It should, if I could, I would suggest a Nobel Prize would be deserved. Um, <laughs> we understand so little about this, but let me make no mistake about it. It is a very, very serious tale to this infection. Whether it's 2% up to 20% of people who get COVID, there's a lot. And whether it's 14 million or 18 million people in the US today that have it, I'm not sure. Well, it is clearly a subsequent series of potential illnesses that can occur after you've had COVID itself. It likely all has a somewhat common origin in inflammation. This virus has a way of really, really causing many of the tissues in your body to get very inflamed. This is why we worry about patients, for example, who then are at risk of heart attacks or strokes because of all the thrombi that are created with this viral infection and what that can do. But today we see a lot of conditions that can all be traced back. Brain fog is one, and I know people with that, and they are very, very, very intelligent people who really have a hard time concentrating today. Fatigue. We see things as not as you say common, but COVID toe. Anybody who's had the inflammation of their toes with this will tell you it's much worse than gout could ever be. I actually have a friend who has COVID tongue who's probably lost 40 pounds in the last 12 weeks because their tongue is so inflamed they can't eat. They can't even have their saliva touch it. It hurts so much. And so all of these are part of this inflammatory process issue. So we try to suppress the immune system to the extent that that will make a difference. But the bottom line is we have a lot of study left to do. And this has been a largely neglected area. We're starting to build centers now around the country to look at this, to try to improve you know, the patient experience so we can study what might work, what doesn't work. But as I said just a moment ago, you know, I don't want to get COVID. And I do believe because of my vaccine status and I have availability of Paxlovid, I'm not that worried about dying. But I am really worried about getting long COVID. I don't want that. And I think the chances are high. And there probably are people in this room right now who have long COVID and could stand up and tell you just how difficult it's been. 
Thank you. We've, we've talked a little bit about vaccines. Um, going forward, should we expect the CDC to recommend an annual COVID vaccine along with our annual flu vaccine? <laughs> you know, this is, I've been saying for some time, we can't boost our way out of this pandemic. And it's not because we couldn't get vaccines every six months or every four months, whatever. We won't. I just got done giving you a figure about how many people have received this new bivalent vaccine booster. And, you know, it, it harkens back to in early December of 2020, one of my podcasts was entitled actually, The Last Mile, The Last Inch. And I even envisioned back then that the last mile was getting vaccine to the people. And particularly those where disparities, health disparities were already a real challenge. But the last inch was, but will they take it? And how many will they take? And there are so many people, so I already had one or two and done, I'm not gonna do anymore. And yet what we know is, is that it's really important to defeat this waning immunity, you need to kind of keep that immune system up. And it's all, you know, you're trying to build up each time it comes back down. So I think that ultimately it's with the current technology we have, you know, it might very well be a situation where you could recommend it, if not every year, every six months, every six months. But I think it'll be a miserable failure because people won't do it. And I understand that. But I think that's where we're going right now. What we need are new vaccines, and that's what SIDRAP's working on right now. We actually lead a global effort uh, with support from the Gates Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, to actually devise a roadmap for how to get game-changing coronavirus vaccines. Everything from basic R&D to manufacturing, finance, and, and uh, policy. So. I think at this point, expect you're gonna see more recommendations coming down the pike for boosters. And I can tell you right now, I will always be first in line to get my booster. Well, it might be a good time to shift gears a little bit. Um, we know that you're the director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Polycidram. Um, let's learn a little bit more about your video. You know, a lot of people think that SIDRAP's a place and actually SIDRAP's an idea where we dream about what the world could be like as opposed to what it is today. And while we often hear that we must be a center all about COVID-19, we actually have a number of major uh, programs ongoing that deal with antibiotic resistance, the drug shortage supplies, getting new and better influenza vaccines, and the whole purpose is to try to make tomorrow better than it is today. We had all these programs in place before COVID ever started. And yet we were able to stop on a dime in terms of how quickly we could pivot to include COVID. We were one of the very first organizations in the world to publish an article on what was happening in Wuhan, China in December of 2019, well before the world even heard about it. We were the very first location in the world that publicly stated that this would be a pandemic. So one of our really unique talents and capabilities is that if a problem arises, we will respond with full force without at any time dropping what else we do. And I think that's really been a hallmark of what's gone on at SIDRAP over the course of these past 20 years. This is all about infrastructure. This is all about people. This is all about a commitment to the future and doing what we can to make the world a better place for our kids and grandkids. So as Lolly mentioned earlier, there are supporters of a vast variety of university programs both with us today in San Francisco and watching online. I know that rings true for your work with SIDREP as well. How does philanthropy shape your work? Well, first of all, let me just say philanthropy is critical because so much of what we do is respond like first responders. Uh, you know, we covered COVID very early on I think we were probably the first institution in the world to declare that COVID would be a worldwide pandemic. We, I did that on January 20th. We put a statement out, uh, 20 of, 20, of 2020. And we adjust our programs all the time to what the crisis is of the moment. 
uh, you know, whether it's monkeypox or Ebola, we happen to be very involved with Ebola relative to, we were the ones that wrote the roadmap for Ebola vaccines for WHO. And there is no funding mechanisms today for people who serve as kind of first responders in public health. You gotta apply for a grant and then it has to have some defined research outcome and it takes a year. Well, by that time, things are all over with and done, you know? Um, and so the philanthropic world has been critical to what we do because it allows us the freedom. You know, we've been blessed, and I, I wanna make sure I make, get this, but Christy Walton, uh, who has been so incredibly kind, supported a major effort that we did and we are continuing to do on drug shortages. We have the most definitive drug tracking system in the world right now at SIDRAP for looking at shortages and why they're occurring, including active pharmaceutical ingredient production in China. And we can tell you on any given day what's happening, where in the world and how. And that helps us plan for all these shortages that occur. Christy has supported that completely. And she's also very kindly put a challenge grant up for our center for part of the fundraising we're doing to build this kind of endowment to keep this work going. But it's just not just Christy. The Vincent Foundation uh, uh, has been very kind to us and they not only support the, uh, the SIDRAP effort, but they also support the University of Minnesota students' scholarships and have done so for many years. And last but not least, I wanna call out to someone near and dear, unorthodox philanthropy out of San Francisco, Mark Lampert and Kathleen Clemens. Kathleen is with us tonight. And they too saw the need for us to be able to stop in a dime and give back nine cents change and have given us unrestricted support, which we have used very targeted at the whole uh, issue of, of COVID. You know, some people say to me, boy, that podcast you do, isn't that something? And my first reaction is, it's not me. There's a team of six people that work their tails off day in and day out to get that information. I just happen to be a, a voice. I happen to be a mouthpiece. And you know what, you know, nobody pays for that? Nobody pays for that. If it weren't for support like the kind Catherine you provide, we couldn't do that. And I know some of you listen to it. Thank you. So, so I can't say enough how much philanthropy means to us and you know, we've tried to be very good stewards of, of what we get and we appreciate any help we can get that way. And all I can promise you is there will be one common purpose. What's it do for our kids and grandkids? And that's how I look at that money. Thank you. So we have just a couple more questions. Um, this one is kind of um, near and dear to my heart. Um, you, it, from your perspective, it's not like if, it's when. And, and what form of next version will be coming. So do you have any information that our national public health departments are preparing rigorously for another pandemic so we can mobilize more quickly if another one breaks out? And perhaps what lessons were learned that are being applied? Uh, I am absolutely convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt. We are less prepared for a pandemic today than we were three years ago. Less prepared. Three years ago, the CDC was a trusted voice of public health in this country. Today, it has sunk desperately, desperately low of anyone trusting its messaging. Public health is not trusted. Second of all, is the media doesn't know how to cover this. And when I say they don't know how to cover it, they never make it a priority to figure out who the hell is telling the truth or who's, who's making the right predictions or getting them right. The same talking heads get on, even though they've just now made their 18th prediction that's been wrong. And there's no check and balance. There's no system to try to get information out to the public that has been vetted in such a way as to say, well, what does this mean or not mean? And so I think we have a lot of challenges with the media right now relative to what you all are hearing because it's just, you know, last week, the Commonwealth Fund put out a study saying, how much disease would be prevented with these new vaccines, the bivalent vaccines. They didn't have a clue about the 
immune evasion issue that was emerging, or how many people would really get the vaccine. And yet that was blasted all over the media. See, everything's okay. Got the vaccine, don't worry about a thing. And there was no real counterbalance to say, well, we hope that's the case, but again, hope's not a strategy. What are the reality? So I think we have a challenge with media. Second of all, I've already, or third of all, I've already shared with you, our healthcare system in this country is a mess, a mess. And we are going to continue to see a lack of preparedness in that area until we come to understand what it's gonna to take to actually make it possible to have that kind of excess capacity if necessary so when things bump up. Next, Congress is done. Congress is done, they put their money out. And right now, the administration's request for more support for vaccines, more testing, have been all turned down. We're watching in the next 60 to 120 days, almost everything around COVID will go back to the private sector. And all those disparities that have been there for so long in private sector healthcare are gonna be there again. And it's gonna be a heck of a problem. And so I could just go on with this. And so I, I'm someone who says, if you're gonna say these things, then do something about it. And so I actually am writing another book. <laughs> um, in which I try to lay out these challenges and what we can do about it. And I keep using the bottom line message of saying, number one, as the old oil fram commercial used to say, you can pay me now or you'll pay me later. And from an economic standpoint, it is one of the best investments we can make to reduce the likelihood that we'll ever see this kind of thing again. I mean, you can build all the missiles you want. You can build all the guns you want, all the airplanes you want. And we do, because we know what would happen if we didn't have them. But we don't think that way with infectious diseases. So I think where we're at right now is one where people want to forget and go away. They don't want to be there. And I understand that. I get that. But that is so counter to wanting to take care of our loved ones and preparing for that, something we can do. And you can't go out and do pandemic preparedness, but where are our elected officials on this right now? You know, they said we're done. Where are we in terms of private sector? Major company has three really promising COVID drugs moving through the pipeline. And when they heard the government was gonna buy any more, they shelved all three of them, put them away. We're done because there's no financial incentive to do these anymore. And I'll tell you right now, I don't know how many days or months it will be, but we're gonna be struggling with Paxlovid-resistant strains of virus. And we're gonna to say to ourselves, oh, why didn't we think about that? That's the mindset we've gotta break. And so that's what we try to do. We try to, you know, I, I, we never wanna be confrontational, but I am not, at all against looking people straight in the eye and saying, can you explain that to me? That I think is where we have to be. And we do have a challenge yet ahead of us. Well, that hour really flew by. So that's our time. And I wanna thank you again for sharing your insights and, and your time thank with you. us this evening, uh, Mike. And thank you all up here in San Francisco and online for joining us this evening. If you're interested in learning more how to get um, involved in the University of Minnesota and how to connect with others in this area, feel free to chat with any of the university representatives in the room tonight. Can you raise your hands so that they can identify you? Come in the back. Come in the front and back. And can I just add one last piece? I know this is for taping, but, you know, thank you to all of you. You know, um, the other day I was in the elevator at the university, it's coming down the parking ramp, and, and this, probably in her late 70s, this woman, I was a patient, I assume, was in the ramp, in the elevator with me, and she looked at me and she said, do I know you? I had my N95 on, I said, well, I don't think so, ma'am. She said, Dad, what do you do? I said, well, I work here at the university. What do you do? I'm a professor. Oh, what do you teach? infectious diseases, and then you see her take two steps back. Are you Mike Osterholm? <laughs> and I said, yes, I'm, she said, 
shut up, stop talking, just shut up. At that point, the elevator doors opened, and I said, thank you very much, and we went our separate ways. You know, uh, there are a lot of people that don't like to hear what we have to say, but there are so many of you in this room who have been so kind, and your comments and your input, and the one thing I have learned that it's a truism, and that is the older I get, the more vulnerable I am to learning. So we welcome your feedback and input into what we're doing and to the podcast or anything we cover on our site. And um, so please do that. You make us better. And I, I so appreciate that. And so thank you very, very much. Uh, as I said, it's a very humbling experience to be sitting here in front of all you tonight. Thank you. Thank you.